Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings and gifts that you have given us in creation, including the blessing of sexuality. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you guide our discussion by your word so that we may do this, talk about these things, and live these out in a, play, in a way that is pleasing to you and in accordance with your will, so that it remains a blessing and doesn't become a stumbling block or a, uh, an issue of sin for us. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I thought that was a really catchy hook for my YouTube video, or my Facebook video that I posted, um, because even if you don't want to talk about sex, the word itself piques your curiosity, and even if you don't want to listen, you just sort of find yourself listening. Uh, human beings are fascinated by sex. It's just a, just a thing. Um, and we should talk about it as the church. Why? Why, why should we talk about sex as the church? Huh? Okay, so it's an, it obviously is an important thing. It affects everybody's lives, right? And it can be a positive aspect or a negative one. Some of us are going to be forgiven. That's all right. Well, I, I think you should rephrase that to all of us are going to need some forgiveness. It's a fun way to grow the priesthood of all believers. Uh, it's a fun way to grow the priesthood of all believers. Okay, yeah, that's a pretty good answer. The Bible talks about it. There you go. Right. So as Christians, uh, anything the Bible talks about is thing are things that we should talk about, especially things that are related to blessings that God wants us to have. Okay. Uh, and sex is one of those things. But you may find out as we go through the class today that the sixth commandment really isn't primarily about sex. It's about something else, which sex is related to in in and obviously a part of, but it's about something bigger. So on page 93, let's read together the sixth commandment. Ready? You shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life by what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other okay so now open up your bibles to matthew chapter 19 we're going to look at verses 5 and 6 so matthew chapter 19 verses 5 and 6 and we're going to be reading that asking ourselves the question is the sixth commandment really about sex matthew chapter 19 verses 5 and 6 Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Or if you're like me and you like the, uh, the KJV translation, like put asunder. Yeah, I always like that when that's included in the wedding ceremony. I don't know why, something about the word asunder. But... <clears throat> So what is, is the commandment, the sixth commandment really about sex or is it about something else? It's about marriage. Yeah, it's about marriage, right? Because where is sexuality put in context of in the scriptures? In marriage. In marriage, in marriage. right? Um, and so the sixth commandment ends up being about sex because it's primarily about marriage, okay? Um, and every time I say that word now, I always think of the dude from The Princess Bride. Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. Okay. Um, and I'm going to work that into a sermon at some point, I promise you. Okay. So if, if it's about marriage, then we should probably be asking ourselves a question. What is marriage? So open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Starting at verse 18, Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 18. And we may think the answer to this question is obvious, but clearly from the, the ways and states of our world, it's probably not as obvious as we think it is. Okay. So Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 18. All right, in the context of this passage, God has created 
all things, and he is given uh, everything is good so far. Adam is tending to the animals and the plants in the Garden of Eden, and everything is great. And in verse 18 is the first time in all creation that God describes something as being not good. Right? He says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Okay? So, if you have, if you're using your own personal Bible, I would underline the word not there. It is is not good. All right, and before the ladies get upset that they're being described as a helper, who else in the scriptures is described as a helper? The Holy Spirit. So this isn't a... Uh, a word of inferiority as our culture would have it be. Right? It, is a, it is a fit pairing, one that is made for the other, is this the sense of this, this here. Okay. 19. Now out of the ground, Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them for, to the man to see him and what he would call them. And whenever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Okay, so that phrase again, right? Um, so basically, he's going through all the animals that are in creation to see if there is a helper fit for Adam among those already created, and the answer was no. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay, so what is marriage? A union between a man and a woman. All right, a union between a man and a woman, right? It specifically says... It specifically says that a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Okay, what else is that? Based on love, hold fast to her. Based on love, okay. What sort of love? God's love. Not, not a romance. Not romantic love? Huh? It's romantic love. I think. God's love is romantic love? No. Between a man and a woman. Well, there's an aspect of romantic love, but we're talking about uh, the love that holds fast. Is that romantic love? The love for each other. Huh? The love for each other. The love for each other, but like... I could say that I love you, but we're not married. Well, and I can genuinely believe that, right? This is going to get a little deep. <laughs> well, I hope so. Pastor, if we want to talk about marriage, we should probably talk about the standard of marriage, the bride and the groom with Christ in the church. And we should look at that as an example of the love Christ has for the church. All right, yeah, so you're referencing Ephesians chapter 5, and the image that Paul uses to compare marriage to is the relationship between Christ and the church. Is Christ romantically in love with the church? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, in what way? Well, I guess I should specify when I say romantic love, I mean like eros. Erotic love. Yeah. So there's there's multiple types of love written about in scripture. There's actually four different Greek words for love, uh, and they signify different aspects of love. So there's eros, which is romantic or sexual love. There's philia, which is brotherly love, like Philadelphia comes from that Philadelphia philia. There is um, agape which is God's love, right? That's the selfless, self-sacrificing sort of love. And I just blanked on the last one. It's like a respect for each other. What? 
Um, story. That's it. Story. Uh, which is like an affection sort of love. Um, There's also a ludus, which is a playful, flirtatious love, and uh, uh, fellatio, self love. Yeah. yeah, those those stem <laughs> from the other four basic concepts of love, though they're not typically referred to as loves in and of themselves. Um, so, like self love is often a corruption of the love you ought to have for like a brother, kind of thing. Um, but anyway, so the, the point is when people say love, they could mean a lot of things, right? Um, and you just look around in our culture and you can tell that the truth of that, right? People will say, you know, um, you hear all these slogans, love conquers all, love trumps hate, you know, love basically means accepting everyone as they are and never criticizing anything about them, all these sorts of things, right? Um, so if Christ and the church is our understanding of love for marriage, how does Christ love the church? What does he do for her? He died for us. He died for us, right? What do we call that? A sacrifice, right? So we often call God's love a sacrificial love. And Paul says that that is the sort of love one is called to in marriage, is a love of self-sacrifice for the sake of the beloved. And, by the way, that it has nothing to do with whether or not they're worthy of your love. Because was the was the church worthy of the love of Christ? No, right? Christ's love made the church worthy, right? So in marriage, the love that's shared between a husband and wife is this self-sacrificing love. Why would it not be a good idea for it to be romantic love, to be the bedrock of marriage? What? It fades, right? Um, C.S. Lewis uses the imagery of diving into the water versus swimming, and that the feeling of in love, the romantic love, the butterflies in the stomach sort of feeling, is the dive into the water. But once you're in the water, you have to swim, right? which is a different skill. And so the love becomes something different over time. It's not that you're, you know, you're never going to have the, the flare-ups of romance ever again after your first three years of marriage or whatever. But that's not the foundation of that love, because romantic love is inherently what? Is it oriented towards the sake of the beloved or for my own sake? It's for mine, right? Romantic love is, it has a selfish component, not, not in a uh, sinful sense, but if it becomes the, the main love of your marriage, it will become that way, right? And the other reason that that's the key aspect of love for marriage is that that is rooted in God. And so when you have marriage between two sinners, the love can't be rooted in either one of you, right? It has to be rooted in a constant source that's going to overcome your failures to love in that fashion. Does that make sense? Right, and so how is it that I'm free to forgive my my wife or my husband, if they've done something against me? Is it because I'm such a magnanimous and wonderful person? No, what's the source of my ability to love them in a self-sacrificing manner? Christ, right? And his love for me in a self-sacrificing manner. Right? Apart from that source of love, I'm not capable of loving in that way. Right? So when you get married, you're actually like, it's actually almost like a triangle. I won't say love triangle because that has weird connotations. But Christ is basically fueling your ability to love one another the way you ought to in marriage. And so without Christ, it's very difficult to maintain that. Because he's the source and the constant. Okay. So marriage... Getting back to the original question, what is marriage? So it's marriage is, is, is grounded in self-sacrificing love that we learn from God. It is union between a man and a woman. What else? What about one man and three women? Or two women and one man? No, why not? It sounds like fun. The Bible says it's one man and one woman. 
Bible says one man and one woman, right? Now we talked about the phrase hold fast. What does that connotate? What sort of relationship this is supposed to be? What? Forever? When did it become monogamous? In Genesis 2. Is that? Yeah, I think yeah. we should talk about that because yeah. there are many instances in the in the Old Testament of of God followers having multiple takes. Oh, yeah, right? Right? Very good. So how do we deal with Abraham and his wife Sarah and his servant Hagar? They made a show out of that called The Handmaid's Tale, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right? So um, even though the Lord works through those things, he never approves of it, right? So when Abraham and his wife, at the urgings of his wife, weirdly enough, is encouraged to sleep with his servant so that they can have a male heir, he's sinning against God in two ways. One, he's not honoring his marriage to his wife, and it doesn't matter if the wife is also the one telling him to do that. He's also having no faith in God because God has promised that he will have a son. So Abraham and, and his wife thought, well, God's taking a long time, so we're going to come up with our own plan here, right? But it is important to acknowledge that the, the monogamous aspect of the relationship of marriage begins at the very beginning when it's defined, right? That a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, okay? Russ? The way that you phrase that reminds me of the way that Genealogy of Matthew, which traces Jesus' name. Yeah. Because clearly that wasn't the, the, the way that if everyone had done what God commanded, that Jesus' line would just have been you know, another line of seed. And, but, but man, he said, if you're able, God makes you good. Right, very good. So Russ made the point that uh, it reminded him of the fact that when you trace the genealogy of Jesus, when I do that in the New Testament, it goes through the line of Bathsheba, which obviously wasn't a, a good and right marriage relationship as God would have set it up, right? And that one had a bunch of other problems like murder and treachery and all kinds of things. Um, but the Lord always works through our evil machinations despite um, to bring about good, right? Um, so there's one other, uh, so we, we before we jump to that train, we're on the train of, is marriage for forever? Till death. So is that forever? No, it's not, right? It's until death. And it's talking about our earthly death, right? And the scriptures do mention that in, in heaven, we will not be given in marriage in the same way that we are here. Okay. Um, so like your, your marriage... This is one of the idolatrous endings that romantic love leads you to, is that, like, the great joy of the afterlife isn't that you'll be with God, but it'll be with the person whom you love, which is true in a sense, right? It is true that you will be with the person you love if they're a believer in Jesus. But the great joy of heaven is not that you'll be with the person you love, it's that you'll be face-to-face -face with God. Um, and so marriage is meant to be in the context of work life. Now, that doesn't mean that he's not going to establish some other way that it, that happens, but we don't know anything about that. So, okay. Um, the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus with that, asking him, you know, if a woman has a husband and he dies, and, you know, there's seven different husbands dying, right. you know, she keeps remarrying, you know, and she committed the sin. Right. And then, uh, yeah, he just. And who is and who is actually her husband? Was it the first one or all the others? And that's when he talks about how in heaven it's not going to be that way. Um, there's one other aspect, and this one is not one we usually think of because it seems so obvious to us, um, but it is exclusively human. Okay, uh, so you can't get married to a dog or a horse or a buffalo. It's one man and one human woman. Okay. So the sixth commandment, though, says you shall not commit adultery. It doesn't talk about marriage explicitly verbatim. So what is adultery? 
breaking your wedding vows. Breaking your wedding vows. Okay, in what way? You're no longer committed to one man or one woman. You've got you brought a third party into the relationship. In what it bring them in in what way? Well, if you have sexual relationships with Okay, so adultery would be bringing a third party in in a sexual relationship in your marriage. So you're breaking your marriage vows. Um, does that have to be actualized for it no. to be adultery? No, no. No, it doesn't, right? What what else would constitute adultery? Lusting for someone. Yeah, having lustful thoughts, right? Lustful intent. Like, like Jimmy Carter. Huh? Like Jimmy Carter. Remember that statement he made? Uh -huh. He committed a sin because he lusted after some woman. Oh. He made a big public to do about it. Yeah. Right. Which, when you're talking about sins of the mind or the heart, it can sometimes backfire because people don't understand what you're saying. And so they think there's something more going on. But who's the person who, who made that clear? Lord Jesus. Jesus did, right? The Lord. In his Sermon on the Mount, he's famous because he goes through there and he says, if you think you kept this in because you didn't do this, truly I say to you, right? And he was making that distinction that it, you're not just guilty of adultery if you actually physically cheat on your spouse, but if you're thinking it, if you're lusting after someone, then you're you're guilty of breaking that commandment, right? Yeah, Mike. Is there a distinction between adultery and coverage? Is there a distinction between adultery and coveting? Because they are two different commandments. Yes. So I presume there is some difference. So I think that the difference is in the specificity. So it's like a rectangle square thing that that all uh, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Does that make yeah. sense? So like, uh, <laughs> adultery is like a, a specific form of coveting as it pertains to sex and marriage. So, so if we were to say that like all forms of adultery are coveting, but not all coveting is adultery. Does that make sense? Adultery only happens within the context of a marital relationship. Yeah, like what defines it as adultery is like the sexual desire in violation of God's will. Okay. Um, Whereas coveting applies to more generally to a bunch of other kinds. <clears throat> yeah. Maybe another distinction, although the way you explained it, they're supposed to be one and the same too. I think coveting is uh, wanting what somebody else wants, but also wanting them not to have it. And so I guess it can come together, but I think that's part of the thing. Yeah, I mean, but. You don't necessarily not, you don't, in order for it to be coveting, you don't necessarily need to not want them to have it. Like coveting is essentially a lack of trust in God's provision for you by desiring to have something that he has not given you by grasping it yourself, right? In a way contrary to his will, right? Um, and the purpose of that is that even if you get it in a way that nobody else realizes was wrong, if it was wrong, you're still guilty of that, right? I have admired your car date, but I've never wished you not to have it. <laughs> As I've walked by it in the parking lot. <laughs> so I, I do think that, like, as far as lustful intent goes, I mean, that is a form of coveting. Right? Because when you lust after someone, do you actually, are you actually desiring them? You're desiring the other person? Or are you desiring their body as an apparatus to meet a need of yourself. And also, Pastor, we, we've mentioned many times that adultery only was is within the confines of marriage, but for people who have not yet become married, we'll get there. after anyone who's not going to be your spouse would also constitute adultery, correct? Yeah, that's the next question on the outline. It was a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good segue. Um, he was talking about the, basically, do you have to be married in order to be at risk for committing adultery? So does this only apply to married people? Um, but before we jump to that, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge what lust is, right? So if you are actually desiring the other person, you would have to know them and know about them in order for you to have lust for them. Is that true? 
No. No, right? You can have, you can see some beautiful woman or man on TV and have lust for them and not know anything about them, right? So you're clearly not desiring them as a person. You're just desiring them as a means to gratify a desire that you have, right? Um, and one of the ways you can tell that is if somebody is um, like, if there's a man out sort of looking for a woman for that purpose, how does he feel about her once his need is met? He typically does not commit to a lifelong relationship with her, right? Because he wasn't really interested in her, but in the pleasure that she could provide him. Okay. Um, Ron. Uh, I guess the problem that I have is then, but. Me too. <laughs> God gave us a mind to think with. Yeah. Okay, you walk down the street or you meet someone, let's say. And so she's pretty, or she said he's nice, and we think, okay. But you still think in your mind, you see someone else, and isn't she pretty too? Sure. You're not going to get those thoughts out of your mind. So every time you have a little thought about anything, it's some sin. That's what I got a problem with. You're thinking about things all the time. Sure. Men and women both. He's, yeah. asking, he's asking for a friend. <laughs> so so this is good this is good so so ron is ron is resisting the idea or at least questioning the idea Question. that like all of these all of these it just seems like the fact that i i'm just like sitting constantly is inescapable and i would say yes it is right that's what jesus is teaching in the sermon on the mount he's saying that like he's talking to, to a group of people who think that they're keeping all those commandments by keeping them externally. So like, I'm not guilty of adultery. I've never cheated on my wife. And then Jesus says, but truly I say to you, if you've had lustful intent, you're guilty of breaking this commandment. Now, why would Jesus do that? Does he just want to be mean and make you feel like, like, oh my gosh, this is the inescapable reality. I'm constantly sinning. And I, like, I, it's not like I can stop it. And I agree with you, right? So if that's the case, what is the purpose of Jesus bringing that up? Why is he teaching the law in that fashion? But we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, I think that's a separate question, but I don't know if that's what you're asking. If you were, I apologize. But you can't think somebody is pretty without lusting after them. It's, there is a distinction there. But the inescapability of your lust in your heart was really, I think, the concern that you had. Um, and it's a good thing to be concerned about. I think the purpose of Jesus raising the mirror of the law is to show you that reality so that you're not putting your trust in what? Yourself. yourself, in your ability to follow God's commands. That's directly what he's addressing, right? He's addressing a group of people that are like, oh, I keep all this, right? And he's saying, no, you don't. And I'm not saying that to make you depressed. I'm saying that so you stop looking in the wrong place for your salvation and start looking in the right place, right? Um, and that's why, like, some people think it's depressing that we begin our confession a lot of times with, I, a poor, miserable sinner, right? And I always, I've always said to them, well, it's only depressing if it's not true, okay? Um, if we're not heaping this accolade on ourselves and we don't deserve it, but, but Jesus is teaching that, in fact, that is our state, and if that's our state, then our salvation comes from elsewhere. And so no matter how great our week went externally, that's always a true confession. And I think the purpose of the law is to make you feel that way. It's, it's part of the purpose is to make you feel, like to use small catechism language, I guess, it is to utterly crush the old Adam. 
And the old Adam is the, the, the part of you that thinks, I got this figured out. I can do this. I can take care of myself. And the law is meant to destroy that part of you so that you stop looking to yourself for salvation, but to Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and by the way, don't feel like you're extra horrible because everybody in the room is in the same boat, right? Oh, I know that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Ron. Okay. Yeah, Dave. I was going to say, I guess somewhere in my mind is he's trying to tell the hearers, try to dissuade them from their self delusion. And that's yeah. really what the Pharisees were told by. But it's also what all of us are. Right. The same thing. It's like I, I kept the letter of the law, so I'm a good guy. Right, right, exactly. Exactly. Um, and that was like I really struggled. Oh, my God. I had a little bit more of a fundamental question. If we're looking at this discussion from an outsider's point of view, sure. Right? There are a lot of successful marriages that occur in the world amongst non believers. Right. Right? Are Christians are Christians claiming that God is responsible for that exclusively? Uh, what's God's role in a successful marriage, a loving marriage, right? You can define sure. it however you want, right? I think if you went around the room, you'd probably get 40 different definitions of what a successful marriage is. But right. are, are Christians, are you saying that God is working through the merit those non-believers to create successful marriages. Is, um, is, is, that what, like a, is that what we want the world to believe? So the question is, like, there are a lot of people who are not Christians who have had uh, quote-unquote successful marriages. And by that, I would typically, usually then that question that the term success means they've been married for 50 years and they did a somewhat decent job of raising their kids. Oh, yeah, and they might they right. love one another. Uh, yeah, right, and they love one another. Whatever the attributes of a successful marriage is for a Christian, I think there are probably lots of those around the world. Sure. Non-Christian. Sure. So there, there's a there's a twofold answer to that question. The first one is um, God makes it clear that He rains His blessings on the just as well as the unjust, right? And so that I would say that that truism applies to marriage, right? So even if you are someone who enters into a marriage without faith, either person, um, it's not as if like God is going to use that as a vengeance against your relationship. Right. Um, it is clear from the scripture that his demeanor is that he he showers his blessings on those who believe and those who don't believe. Okay. Um, I do think that um, what he would define success as is important, especially in the context of marriage, because I think God defines sex or success in the context of marriage in a per pretty particular way. Right. Um, so if you uh, you know. You can stay together for 60 years, but you both uh, end up, or one of you drives the other to unbelief, or um, you, you never talk about faith with your children as per your vocation as Christian parents. That would, like, that could look externally to the world as a very successful family and marriage. Well, clearly, non believers non believers are not going to be talking to their children about Christian sure. faith. Right. That's, that's an exception, right? Yeah. So... The, so are Christians defining that as an unsuccessful marriage? Is that what we're um, saying? I don't know if you would define it as unsuccessful. Um, you would probably, I mean, if if they're actively leading their children away from Jesus, then yes, we would. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but as far as the way we would describe that is sort of the way I would describe somebody who does who says they're Christian but doesn't attend church, is that I can't say because I don't have the authority or the knowledge to say that you're not a Christian, but you're living your Christian life in an extremely unwise and at-risk manner. I think another way to answer that might be that none of us can claim any of the good things in our life come from us so that none of us can boast. So therefore, if anyone does have a successful marriage, as the standard as God would define it, we would have to say that blessing has come from the Holy Spirit and not from us. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the like, that's what we mean when we're talking about that God rains his blessings on the believer and unbeliever alike, right? Is that 
the good that results from my behavior or my life, because I'm as Ron described, right? I'm I'm hopeless on my own. I'm I'm like inescapably sinning all the time in a way that I cannot prevent when it comes to the heart and the mind. And so I I'm not the source of success and good, either as a believer who's aware of where that comes from or an unbeliever who's not aware. Right. Um, I'm not even sure if it would even, if Christians would even or ought to even bother figuring out whether um, we would describe an, an unbeliever's marriage as successful or not. I think that's sort of jumping the gun in the sense that you're talking about law stuff with someone who doesn't even believe in God yet. Um, so it would be more about, hey, there's some, like, you guys have a really great marriage. And you you mentioned to me that you're curious about faith. Well, that's an area where I can tell you that I think the source of the good stuff in your marriage, what we believe, is that that comes from God. Right? Um, and so we would talk about it more in those terms rather than like a comparison contrast. I think for the most part, it's wrapped up mostly in the reality that we know that God showers his blessings on believer and unbeliever. Probably in the long run for the purpose of evangelism, right? Um, and if he didn't do that, as Pete said, you know, the good that comes from our lives and theirs is from the same source. So if God didn't do that, we'd all be in big trouble, right? Uh, but that's a great question. Okay, uh, letter D. Does this apply or only apply to married people? So uh, open up your Bibles to Matthew 5. 27 and 28. Speaking of the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, so does this only apply to married people? Well, I think the threshold question, given the basis of the other definitional things that you've done is, does this only apply to men? Because it doesn't make any reference to women. We'll, we'll men. get there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're... you're you're saying in Genesis it applies to man and woman because it says the two, right? And so if you're going to take that literal reading, yeah. right, you sort of have to, that literal reading would flow through everywhere unless you have some other way of explaining it. No, that's, that's correct. So the, the way that we would understand this is that this is being spoken about specifically in the context of the Sixth Commandment. And the Sixth Commandment is specifically in the context of marriage as God created and instituted. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but does this rule apply only to marriage for people who are married? I think even um, singles have to keep themselves pure and for married. So. Yeah. All right. So if if uh, I'm 16 and I have sex out of wedlock and I don't end up getting married to the person I have sex with, and I get married to another girl five or six years later, who have I committed adultery against? God. Huh? Well, I've sinned against God, but who 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 have I committed adultery against? The one that I married, right? Even though we weren't married yet, I can no longer, with the same sort of sense, give her the same promise, right? Now that doesn't that doesn't mean that when Christ comes into play, right, we're not hanging these sorts of sins over the people's heads, right? Those sins are forgiven. And you can retain. So we're not talking about purity in the sense of virginity. We're talking about purity in the sense of chastity. Right? And there's a big difference there. Was virginity is a biological term, which means that you've never had sex before. Right? Chastity is the state of sexual purity. So someone who's had sex with multiple people can become chaste. By repenting of those sins and living a sexually pure life in the context of a monogamous marriage relationship. 
right? And somebody who's in a monogamous marriage relationship can become unchaste, right? And they don't even necessarily have to cheat on somebody to do that, right? Because as Jesus is teaching us here, it's something that occurs in the heart, right? So when you're when you get married to somebody, your behavior prior to that is related to your state of sexual purity. Not because once it's done, it's like, well, sorry, you're out of luck, but that the posture of your um, repentance of that is the important part. Yeah. This isn't a this isn't said for us to condemn each other or to judge one another. It's for us to have self recognition and work on changing our thought processes in the way that we conduct ourselves, right? Even without action, just in, in our thoughts. Yes. Work. So. Um, so Jim made the point that this isn't being brought to us as a means of judging one another, but as a way of you know, reflecting and judging ourselves so that we can um, repent of those things and change, right? Awareness. Awareness. But it, I would say that the biblical understanding of judgment brings those two things together. So judgment has a bad connotation in our culture. Right? Well, you don't judge people. Well, the part where the Bible says don't judge people, it's not saying don't judge. It's saying the standard by which you judge will be the standard you are judged by, right? So it's the whole log in my eye to remove the plank in my friend's eye. And that is specifically being spoken of in terms of judgment between Christian brothers and sisters, right? So by being in this room and saying you believe in Jesus, you're, you're essentially confessing to me that you believe these laws of God are true and good, and ought to be followed, right? So let's say I observe a brother or sister in Christ breaking these laws, maybe in an ignorant and, un and or unrepentant manner. Should I judge them? Or should I speak judgment? It's not your place to judge? Why not? That's God's place. Okay. Well, you're not judging their salvation and damnation. That is God's place. None of us are perfect. <laughs> Believe it or not. Sure. That's true. <laughs> but if I'm judging somebody else's behavior. You always have trouble doing that. You have trouble having that conversation. Sure. But it's like you wouldn't tell someone who was essentially committing an act that would essentially jeopardize life, their soul, their family, their future. Uh, hey, I'm going to tell you that's wrong. You know? So, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to get wrapped up in the mechanics of what it looks like, but, you know, when you see someone completely throw away a, a, a marriage that was ordained by God for something that is, is adulterous, of course you judge that. You judge that in the fashion that you know that what God has told us is that, that this is not the way that that right. So well, let me take a step back. What is the purpose of the judging and what exact is being judged? So first, are you judging your brother and sister, like the person, or are you judging their behavior? We're taught to use the scripture to teach, rebuke, reproof, correct, but it doesn't say to use the scripture to 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 judge necessarily, but to correct somebody, you have to say they're doing something wrong. So in that sense, yes, you are judging. Yeah. So but part of my point in bringing this up is like typically even in Christian circles, you hear the word judge and it's immediately, oh, we can't do that. But what, what is judging? Right. In the context of the scriptures and in the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christ, judgment is like what, what the world would call judgment is actually a form of living out your sanctified life and love for your Christian brother and sister. Like, that's what Christ did for us, right? He saw us living in ways that led to destruction, and judgment must have been done, and so he put his, himself in place of that judgment, right? That's an interceding sort of love, and he calls us to do the same among the brothers and sisters in Christ, right? That, and the purpose of that judging is not condemnation. The purpose of that judging is repentance, compassion, 
and pointing back to Christ. Okay? Like your motivation for, for speaking out against the behavior of a brother or sister in Christ is not to like tear them down, right? Which is what you typically think of when somebody says judge. The purpose is to point them to Jesus, right? And, and that's done, like think about the way it's done in your own life. How are you pointed to Jesus when you're living in a sinful manner or you've done something sinful? There's judgment of all of that. And usually it's judgment, right? When the law is, is holding up the mirror, what it's doing is it's judging you, right? The other important thing to, to keep in mind is when you're using the scriptures to rebuke and reprove and correct, in, order, in other words, to judge the actions of believers, whose authority is that on? What's actually judging? God, right? You're not actually judging them when you're referring to the scriptures, right? The law is doing the judging, which comes from God, right? Which is why I can't say, uh, Janet, that green shirt is sinful, and I'm judging you because you're wearing it, right? I can't do that. I have no authority, as you said earlier. I have no authority to judge you. But who does? God does. And how do we know what he wants us to do and how to live? He told us, right? And so out of compassion for my brother and sister in Christ, I ought to remind them of that by bringing the law to bear. And the law does the judging. And the purpose of the law doing the judging is to drive them back to Christ. Right? Yeah, my. it's a little. I understand that conceptually, but in real life, that could be all you ever talk to people about because everybody is sitting all of the time. You sure. Know, how do you pick and choose? That's that's a great question. That's the that's the problem. That's, I think the church has had a very difficult time with discernment when it comes to things like this because they have, by their nature or by their actions treated some sins as worse than others, right? Because they harp on them constantly, sure. Sure. right? And ignore others that are just as obvious, just as prevalent, just as damaging. So, you know, it's easy to say, reprove your Christian, you're doing your job, but how do you pay? Right. Yeah. So that's a great question. Like, if if we're if we're all out on the prowl for our brothers and sisters' sins, where that's like all you're going to ever spend your time doing, right? Fellowship would not be fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would ruin fellowship, right? Um, spent, so the question is, yesterday, walking around telling everybody, how do you pick and choose? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So um, generally, the distinction given to the church in the scriptures is repentance versus unrepentance. So, for example, um, like Ron just informed me that he's always thinking things he shouldn't think in his head. So <laughs> welcome to the club, Ron. Right? Um, so should I be like, you know, basically following Ron around all week? Be like, yes. What were you thinking just now? What were you thinking just now? Right. Um, but then I see Ron coming to church and he's confessing his sins and repenting of those sins. Right. Um, the the time where we're called. Uh, to reprove or correct our, our brother or sister in Christ is when they're living as if their sin is not sin. In other words, they're not repentant of it. Because that for us is the spiritual danger. Right? The spiritual danger of sin, because Christ has come into the world and has done what he's done, is no longer just the fact that we are sinners. Because that has been forgiven. The danger with sin now is living as if that sin is not sin, in other words, I'm not repenting and turning to Christ. And you rightly point out that that could be any sin that would fall into that category. So if I'm a pathological liar and I'm lying constantly and Mike becomes aware of it and he, and he, and he observes in me a behavior about that that like it's clear that I don't have any issue with it, then he should step in. Right? But not as if like Oh, somebody responded in anger to somebody else. I need to immediately insert myself into that situation. It's more of a, uh, and we'll talk about this more when we get to the office of the keys. 
stuff because that's what the office of keys is about given to the church uh, and its leaders so that the law can be used in a compassionate way to draw on repentance to repentance and then back to christ does that sort of answer me it's good that we talked about that I think yes oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i I did not anticipate us going this far into this particular discussion today. So that, but so it's good that you asked that question. Yeah. In a way, I know my life. I'm a big believer in Hebrews 10:24, 25. You know, to get together, um, to uh, fellowship, to challenge one another. And out of that, I think a lot of it is that we do, especially with another brother, so when we feel that God will willing, it just happens that you'll confess something, and then other persons there. Not to spit at you, not to throw you out, but to challenge you in a way that's godly and will stick to you regardless. Right. And it's hard. It's, it's, I mean, it is the wise role to point out all of our flaws as husbands, right? I mean, <laughs> it is in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> uh, Rob, yeah. What's the word that means uh, when, when you see somebody? We're really uh, committing the same sin over and over. Uh, people, some people have a gift of calling these people out. And, you know, what's that work? I'm, I'm the not gift sure of, being, you know, of being able to, you know, approach people, you know, oh. fellow Christians. Sure. Exhortation. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I always think of that as fun. Well, it is. Exhortation is very good, but not many are good at it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I mean, like I, the thing that always helps me is, um, I imagine I try to imagine. All right, if if I'm Jesus and I'm observing this, do I am I intervening, right? Um, and if his intervention is is naturally the context of confession and absolution and forgiveness, then I'm not worried. But like if my friend who I'm worried about stops showing up to church, and if I see them doing something over and over and over again as if it's not nothing wrong. That's when I start to become concerned, right? And, and the loving action then is actually to admonish them so that they don't continue in the way they're going. Um, and I've, re I've referenced C.S. Lewis like five times today already, but he has another great line about uh, if, you're, if you're on the wrong path, what's the first step in the right direction? Turning around, right? Um, and a lot of times, if somebody doesn't realize they're on the wrong path, they don't want to turn around. And so, we are afraid to bring that up, even in a loving manner, because we want them to know that our communication to them is that our desire is that they turn and live. So I'm not saying this as like, I'm great and perfect and you're terrible. But it's still a scary thing to do because our own sinful flesh and their own sinful flesh is going to want to try and twist that into something that it's not meant to be. So that's a great question. Um, so don't follow your brothers and sisters in Christ around and try and figure out all the terrible things they're doing. Okay. That's the whole point of the verse about the log in your own eye, by the way. Okay. Any other questions about that one? So in conclusion, it does not only apply to married people. It's about sexual purity, period. That adultery does obviously end up affecting marriage, but it's, it's more about your the heart posture about sexuality in compliance with God's will. Right. All right, letter E. So turn to page 94 and 95 in your catechism. What does God forbid and command here? This is question 68 on page 94. How do we fear and love God in keeping the sixth commandment? Uh, letter A, treating our bodies as holy, set apart for the purpose for which God created us as male and female, and not as objects that serve our selfish desires. First Thessalonians 4, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And then 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, 
nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So that's a beautiful verse there about kind of what we just talked about. Because right, after he gives this big, long litany of things that are not correct, he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So the judgment that's being made on these behaviors is not like from one perfect group to some imperfect group, right? And such were some of you. And I, have, I did look up the Greek there because I, I figured some people, there are arguments that that word doesn't really refer directly to homosexuality in 1 Corinthians 6. And there's other places as well where it talks about um, the Lord giving them up to the like, unnatural passions. And so they exchanged natural relationships between a man and a woman with one another and vice versa with women. So the Bible, we, we confess in the Lutheran Church that the Bible speaks Directly against homosexuality is a sin. Right? Yeah. How are you supposed to deal with the world today? Is saying whatever you want to do is all right. Yeah. I mean, it's all over television, Congress, everywhere. Do this, and it's okay. And if you if you are against that, you're looked down upon. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, how do you deal with the world of today, where? Um, all that stuff is okay, and if you if you're against it, you're looked down upon and judged. Um, well, I was actually because I knew I was going to be talking about this when I was preparing my sermon for today. Was thinking about exactly this this dilemma in terms of the foolishness of God versus the wisdom of men, right? Where the Bible makes it clear through Paul and Jesus' own teachings verbatim, he talks about that basically people will hate you just for loving me and this is an example of that right um and so this is why like i found it very powerful in the in the first corinthians text for um the epistle reading today that i should stop trying to rely on my own ability to craft like a winning argument to convince people of, of these things because i'm not what's going to convince them right because what I'm offering them as an unbeliever seems foolishness, seems like hatred, seems like judgment. But those things are only hatred and judgment if God is not real and his law is not real. Um, if those things are real, then my encouragement away from these things is actually love. But I should not expect them to recognize that. Right? And the reason that I say that is not to be depressing or despairing about other people, but to sort of have a realistic awareness about the way I'm going to be treated, even if I if I do talk about it in a loving way, right? So, um, and this comes up a lot. I mean, I, when I was at my previous call, many of the particular questions and things that I was asked to deal with in, in the context of family would be. You know, one of my kids at school, their friend just came out as being gay. I don't even know how to talk to them about that. How do I talk to them about it? You know, how do I how do I teach them to to interact with this person in a loving manner, but also a faithful manner? You know, those are difficult questions. Um, and it kind of just goes back again to the way we talked about our basic orientation of why we bring the law of God into play. Um, is in this particular case, let's say it's somebody who's an unbeliever that you're friends with and you're a believer, the law is not really going to be helpful because they don't believe it, right? Um, but it is helpful for you in the context of your relationship with them in how I should approach the way that I, I interact. Uh, and the way that I would interact is, um, you know, loving them because they're a sinner just like me. So to Mike's point, it's not like, homosexuality is some super special sin worse than, than being a liar or, you know, thinking about people of lust in my heart, right? It's not. In the eyes of God, it's the same. Um, but I genuinely care about this person, and scripturally speaking, that means that I ought to seek opportunities 
to point them to Jesus and away from this thing that is going to ultimately cause them problems. Right? And that could be homosexuality. It could be um, that they're sleeping with multiple people, even though they're heterosexual or whatever it may be. Um, to my point again, those like it's the unrepentant state of a particular sin that is the spiritual danger of the rejection of the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, so a lot of the Christian life, and I think it's going to become even more so, especially in our culture that we're used to, is going to be living in this tension and learning to become comfortable with being the other. Um, because as a follower of Christ, you subscribe to a different set of rules. And as the and we have enjoyed the fact that we lived in a culture that largely agreed with those sets of rules for a long time. Uh, and it's becoming less and less so. Yeah. Yeah. In that particular example, I mean, it sort of points out that sometimes the church accords certain sins some type of special categories, right? Sure. You know, the person is asking, how do I talk to this person? You know, well, they're no different than they were before. You, how did you talk to them before? This is just, they were engaging in any number of sins sure. before right. they came out of the closet, right? Yeah. Why is that different? It's because, so, it's, is it? Is there it, is a difference there, but it's not what it's usually ascribed to be. So well, the difference yeah. isn't that, like, now instead of this person being John, my friend, that's John the gay. It's that my friend has now informed me that whatever this particular, like if, if your friend came out to you and said, um, I think lying is, is totally fine and I'm just going to do it all over the place. Right? That would essentially in principle be the same sort of situation. You're getting a public declaration of somebody you care about that something you believe to be a sin is no longer a sin and I'm going to live my life as if that's true. Right? It's not unique to homosexuality. It could be any any number of things, right? So it could be your friend who feels that way about sleeping around in general. So he's sleeping with women, but he's just sleeping with whoever he wants to. He just doesn't come to call you up and say, hey, right. Adam, I just want to let you know, I enjoy sleeping around. Yeah, right, exactly. Right? And so that, that well, isn't... Uh, all of a sudden you're different. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. And so it isn't, it isn't even all the church, actually. It's also the culture. So the culture elevates those things to a high level. Um, and it for a different reason, but then it becomes elevated all the same. And so it becomes an issue that is harder to deal with as a result of that. Yeah. Um, I might have missed something. But I think sure. Right. But what about people that say um, that it's a genetic that some people say I'm like, Oh, great question. Yeah. So uh, the question was, what if somebody makes the argument from genetics? Um, I really struggled with that for a long time. Uh, and there isn't a whole lot of concrete proof that that's true, but let's say it was. Um, does anyone in here have maybe more, they feel maybe more than other people around them a propensity to get angry? Sure. Right? Is that, was that a genetic thing? Maybe. Right? Does it make a difference? Like, if I can then say, well, my 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 quickness to anger is actually a genetic thing, and if I say that as a means of proving that my punching in the face is no longer wrong, does anybody accept that? No, right? What do we say? Well, go see somebody and work on that, right? So this is a similar thing where, like, part of the the belief of the doctrine of original sin is that our nature. Is inherently corrupted. In other words, it, there are lots of things about us as creatures that don't work the way they are. Um, and so that was because I really struggled with that. It's a great question. I really struggled with it for a long time until I had somebody kind of explain that to me in a different context. Right. Um, and so what that ought to do, let's say that is true, what that ought to do is move us to even more compassion right? and recognition that. No, this is a really serious struggle for this person. It's not like they've just chosen to do something, but it's something that is a difficult struggle for them. Just like it is that somebody has to go to anger management, right? Um, so so that, that's sort of the way that we would respond to that sort of argumentation is that, you know, the doctrine of original sin teaches that not only am I I'm actively sinning, but that's more of a symptomatic outpouring of my inherently corrupted creatureliness as a result of sin.
And Pastor, to make your point, we just read 1 Corinthians 6, and in that list of different sins is drunkards, and that has been established scientifically as alcoholism can be genetically um, inherited. Yeah, great point. So it, it doesn't really matter. We've all inherited sin all the way back from Adam. Right. And it's actually, when you get the proper mindset about it, it should move you to more compassion for them and humility for yourself. Because right? then you recognize that like, well, this person's struggle with homosexuality may be very similar to my struggle with anger or my struggle with lust or whatever it may be. Because some people struggle with particular sins more than others. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Mm. Faster. Sorry, it's, uh, it's, it's a little hard to break in from the from remote here. But yeah, just uh, to chime in on that point. I mean, I think like Mike, Mike's earlier point was was really important because there's a lot of this perception about how the church, you know, handles or mishandles sin. Right. And, and I think, you know, we could talk about is it because of focus on particular sins? Is it hypocrisy? You know, these are both damaging things if it feels like lopsided. But I think another part of it is just the, the sort of public ostracizing, you know, like, I mean, think about the Scarlet Letter, right? Everyone reads the Scarlet Letter now. Is this like counterpoint to, you know, what Christianity, you know, should be. And, um, you know, it's, it's all about publicly ousting people, calling them out at the pulpit and, you know, narrowly focusing on whatever sin they, they want to. And the point, I, your point about compassion, I think, makes perfect sense because this verse in here, this is this is the uh, the Duck Dynasty verse that almost brought them off of the air, right? Because one of those guys on that TV show, he had, I don't know, he read this or said something about it publicly, and his point was not to attack people. And others may disagree, but you know, my my understanding was he was saying this because he personally identified with this verse, right, that he had fallen short um, uh, in, in some of these areas, many of these areas, and he saw, he found the, the redemption, you know, so if we're using it in a compassionate way, I think that's the, the point, or, or inwardly, but not to just, you know, publicly out people, or, you know, it's this idea of this, like, Westboro Baptist Church, whatever they're called, you know, let's, let's get on a high hill and start shouting about how evil people are, that's, that's terrible, you know, it's not helping anybody. And, and I think uh, that's a great point. And I think the one of the things that I've, I've observed is we've gotten much better, I think, in, in large terms to having compassion for things that previously we were very ill-equipped um, and poorly taught to deal with. But I have noticed, too, that people forget that that same compassion still applies to your brothers and sisters in the church. Right? And so... It's also important that when we're talking about these things, not to be like treating um, the brothers and sisters in the church as like extra horrible um, because they're failing at doing these things. You shouldn't be surprised that the church is failing at doing some of these things. It's full of a bunch of redeemed sinners. Right? Um, and so the compassion that I feel for my friend who's struggling with homosexuality should be the same compassion that I feel for my brother in Christ who's dealing with the wrong sort of judging of that person. And I need to help lead him back to a place where he feels compassion instead of judgment in the wrong sense for them. Um, yeah. Okay. Jim, you had something in the, was it David? So Jim. I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, because you're a man of the cloth and you see things that the rest of us probably and hear about things the rest of us don't, how often do people that go down that path of homosexuality come back? from it because it doesn't seem like something that you come back from easily. Uh, you know, um, so there's a really good person to read. Um, his name is Henry Nowen. He was a Roman Catholic priest who had a, a fairly open struggle with tendencies towards homosexuality. He never lived them out. Uh, but so he has a really, as a result, I think one of the ways the Lord worked through that is he has a very acute sense of forgiveness and compassion as a result. Um, but I would say that it's probably, for people who have genuine faith, it's probably not something that they make public, right? And so it could be something they struggle with, and they maybe have a few people that they share that struggle with um, as a means of helping them. But I think it's probably uh, probably dealt with privately for the most part. So there are, you may not necessarily know unless you're one of the people they decide to share with, which 
if they do, you should you should be honored and humbled and and take that role seriously. Um, but as far as like coming back from it, it depends on what's driving it in the first place. So one of the one of the issues now is because it's become something so celebrated in culture, like they're they're observing confusion about gender and sexuality in much larger numbers than historically have been present because of social influences. So it's entirely, there are numerous cases, uh, Rosaria Butterfield is one that I can name. Um, she wrote a book about it. She was a, uh, she was in a lesbian marriage and she taught women's studies at a pretty liberal school. Uh, and she ended up becoming a, a Christian and turning away from all that. And I think a large part of that was because in her particular case, it was driven a lot by the environment she was in and the social um, influence that it gave. So there is some of that um, at play. But people who genuinely struggle with it, I think it's the same as any other sin that you genuinely struggle with. It's something that you never really leave behind. Uh, and that is the great hope of, of the day of judgment, right? Is that, that when everything is made new, that finally does get left behind in a total sense, um, which is why there's never going to be a Sunday you come here and we're not beginning with a confession of sin. Right? Um, so does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then Dave, and I think we're about out of time. So yeah. this will be the last question. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, I think the emphasis on the church now with more compassion, focusing on people, I think that's just a much better way to go. It doesn't mean you condone the sin, but with, and I, this is along the lines of what Mike was saying, but I, being an elder and being a, a pastor in a church, it's really difficult. I know talks are the key to the, the discussion today, but because we're talking about sexual sure. sexual sin, it's just one of those, it's a public, it's a public thing. And so in the past, it was always like, okay, now we're going to approach you on this because it's a public thing. We publicly see that you're not repenting. Okay. But I say that you hear stories about other churches and where people were excommunicated. Okay? I'm not saying here, but people were excommunicated for certain public sins uh, because they're so apparent and because that troubles the community. But when was the last time somebody was excommunicated because they hated their sister and were totally unrepentant? And, and that was expressed. When was the last time that happened? So that's where, that's where we struggle with church. Where do you get to the point where you take the further steps, and I know we're talking about the office of the key. Yep. That's really problem. I think, I think the, the the social, the, the society's um, punishments for homosexuality and other non-traditional gender views and roles and things of that nature present a tremendous challenge to the church. It's either going to say we want to be the compassionate people that Jesus calls us to be, or we're going to double down on our centuries of prejudice, right? Because I think there's been, a, we've committed, I think the church has committed a lot of the sin of prejudice as it relates to these types of things. We have to decide where we're going to be. This is a challenge for us to decide what, what our attitude is going to be, not to decide that it's okay, right, from a sin standpoint, but sure. how we react to it and how we treat these, how we treat folks who are having these struggles. Well, in the the meat of that question is it, what what constitutes faithful living out of my identity in Christ in those particular situations, right? Because um, I think it's pretty easy and, and pretty uh, in most circles now universally understood that. Like, while we disagree with homosexuality, it is also sinful for me to hate the person, right, and to, and to ostracize them and shun them as a result of that, um, which used to be the practice. So, but I would say that, historically speaking, too, we have to make sure that we don't lump all that as prejudice, because some of it was not prejudice, right? Um, and so, and, and of course, that is the difficulty. The, it, the difficulty is there isn't an easy answer, right? It isn't like I can say, well, this is the rule. And it applies this way in every case, right? Um, and so uh, part of the problems that the church has had is they wish that to be true when it wasn't, right? Um, and so, because it's a lot easier to, to make those statements and then not get into the mess of it with the particular person that you're talking about. 
Um, and that's what communicates that, that uh, the, the Christian love in that relationship is actually like being there with that person, whether it's about homosexuality, whether it's about um, they've committed adultery and their marriage is in trouble, whether it's about, um, you know, they, they hit somebody they shouldn't have hit or whatever it may be, right, um, that they're struggling with. The calling for the Christian is to be in them and be with them in that situation and have compassion, but also be faithful in the way that that's applied. Compassion for the purpose of what? Just to make you feel better? Not, not really. Compassion so that you're pointed to Christ who can relieve you of the guilt of what you've done. Right? Um, and just to end on that, on that note, um, a lot of times referenced is Matthew 18 and the cross that's laid out there and pointed at sort of the, this misunderstanding that has been highlighted multiple times by different people here is at the end of that, it says to treat them as a tax collector or sinner. And most people interpret that as like they're kicked out of the church and you'll have nothing to do with them anymore, which is wrong. How are Christians supposed to interact with tax collectors and sinners? They're supposed to love them and have compassion on them and point them to Christ. And so basically all that's saying there is that this person now becomes to you an unbeliever insofar as you need to share the gospel with them. And you still desire for them to return to the table. Okay. Um, we'll finish up with the sixth commandment uh, next week. Um, there's just a few points left that I wanted to discuss, and then we'll probably start with the seventh commandment as well. Uh, so let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to rescue us from all of the sins that we struggle with, sins that we cannot prevent and that we cannot free ourselves from, whatever they may be, Lord. We know that they have been forgiven in Christ. Continue to sustain us in that faith. And be with us as we live out that faith and interact with those that we care about in our relationships at work, in our family, at home, um, and just in our community at large. Grant us humility and compassion for those struggling in sin in whichever form it takes. Help us to use that compassion to point them to you so that they can return to the path that you would have them be on, which leads to life. Help us to that end. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. Thank you.